Hey, welcome! Thanks for tuning in! This is There's Something About Artists, a podcast where I discuss with experts and industry leaders about the many sides of the artist industry. I'm your host, Federico Bianculo. I'm an artist artist, founder of The Big Picture, blogger and content creator in the field of architectural representation. I'm on a journey to learn more on all things about art base, art direction, business, technology, you name it. And I would like you to be a part of this journey as well. Through these conversations, my hope is to bring light to not so obvious topics connected to our industry and help you grow as a professional, as an artist, and why not, as a human being as well. So please join me. Without further ado, let's jump into today's episode of There's Something About Art Base. Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of There's Something About Arby's. Today I'm back with a somewhat provoking thought for you all. I've been thinking lately and realized that while the discussion in our industry is still very much focused on the artistic side of the job, it is not so much on the breadth of possibilities brought by our expertise outside the pure image making thing. And this is especially true nowadays, in an age where it is not uncommon to have multiple income streams and activities. I think that our community should definitely start reflecting upon this topic and maybe steer away a bit from viewing 3D art as a life mission, you know. Mind you, nothing wrong with that, but perhaps exploring different fields could be an interesting option. And we already have several successful case studies in the art based industry. One of these is Lisa De La Dora, my guest for this episode. Now a senior artist for Bloom Images, Lisa has several years of experience working for international art based firms. She is the mind behind Render It, a series of interviews to over 40 Italian art based artists, which also became a thriving community. Lisa is also a teacher and since summer 2020 she joined the UAV postgraduate master in digital architecture as an art director. All of this while being a full-time mom, which is no small feat at all. I wanted her on the show to discuss why is it worth it to explore side activities as an art based artist, how to manage your own time in pursuing these new projects, and we also touch upon the topic of working from home. Lisa has in fact been working from home for almost four years now, and she definitely gave some good tips to all of us struggling to adapt to this new normality. But I think that's all for me. Please enjoy my chat with Lisa De La Dora. I discovered something funny. Okay. I know that you worked at Sinai. In Germany, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my first job in Berlin. Yes. We worked in the same building at different times. Ah, you were at Zara Buchhattung. Yes, I was at Zara ah. But I was there in 2013. 13. I arrived in 14. I arrived there in, yes, September 2013 and I left in March 2014. I remember they were building their own house in that lot at the time. Matthias and Luis, yeah, the, really? the owners from, yes, wow. the owners Depressing. from the... Yeah. Depressing, there was nothing there. I mean, we were eating netto all the time. That uh, Was it the Lidl? No, I think it was a netto. It was either netto or kebab at the end of Lerterstrasse. That was the maximum that you could have there. Yeah, and I was the only freaking one not speaking German uh, in 40 people. It was kind of depressing. But then you picked up with German. I've been studying it all the time. Uh, since I moved to Berlin, uh, I've never stopped, but pff, it's it's freaking hard. And I mean, the first year, it's like you are an alien, you don't get even a word. Then after a year, I think I actually started understanding what they were saying, but replying was another word. And then I start going out because actually I wasn't even hanging out with them because I mean, I was so left out all the time but at some point they told me oh Lisa why are you so shy I mean I'm not shy guys I'm <laughs> nobody's speaking to me you're not giving me a chance and then at that point I say maybe I should make an effort and then I start hanging out with them and I was <laughs> drinking and at that point I could speak German that's the best way of speaking a foreign language in my opinion <laughs> definitely yeah. well Salabruch was Kind of more international, at least interns were internationals. Yeah, there were I mean, there were architects that were internationals as well, but yeah. they were all German speaking architects in a way or in another one. The thing is that landscape architecture is in Germany it's like you know, getting to a cult because they are really into it. You are either an architect or a landscape architect. It's not like in here that 
when you're done with architecture, you can just say, oh, I'm this and that, I can do everything. There you have to decide if you study one or if you study the other one. So there are really no, there's stuff about uh, plants, so they know everything and I knew nothing. I mean, I, I actually came out of a landscape architecture postgraduate master. Uh, no, it was not a postgraduate, it was my master degree. It was in sustainability and landscape with <laughs> like landscape, you know. And this ties well with your story. You started as a landscape architect, so we can start talking really about you, how you, you got into ArcVis and how you got started with your own projects, which is, by the way, today's topic. Personal projects in ArcVis, managing time. So let's, let's talk about you. Let's talk about how you shifted from landscape architecture to ArcVis. When I finished uh, studying, I felt really, really insecure about myself. I, I mean, I moved to Berlin right away. It was me and Andrea, and he was then my boyfriend now, he's my husband. And we didn't even search for a job in Italy. We just moved to Berlin right away. Uh, we had a nice experience during the summer at the Biennale of Venice, underpaid internship, but it was super nice still. Uh, it was nice to put in the curriculum, so I really didn't mind that much at the time. And then we moved to Berlin, but I, had, I really had zero experience whatsoever. And I mean, I, I don't know why. Actually, I, I thought I was more into landscape. I, didn't, I, I don't think I applied to any architecture, pure architecture firms. I was searching for a landscape architecture office. I didn't know that in, in Germany it was that much, like focused on just the landscape. Uh, which is super cool, but uh, that's something I didn't know that much at, at that point. And I wanted to work on competitions. And the reason is that I never liked doing the design that much, actually. So I thought working on competition is the perfect deal because I'm an architect. I work in an architectural firm, but I don't have to design the stuff. I just have to represent it. But that's not really how it went down. So yeah, I was doing some Photoshop stuff. Couple of times I managed to uh, work in SketchUp too and was quite excited <laughs> about that. But not at all what I had in mind. And I realized I really didn't like working as an architect. And I mean, uh, I was working at Sinai and uh, the place was amazing. I mean, they had amazing projects. And um, it was so interesting because they also had some people designing just playgrounds and they were like really designing the playgrounds, not sh where should I put this toy or where should I play this, like building them from scratch, like this dragon stuff, it was super cool. But that's not something that I was doing anyway. I think I worked there uh, a year, a year and a half. And then I was kind of burned out. I was working way too much. I couldn't be also workaholic, not that it's something good, but I could be that too, but not if it's something I'm not excited about. So I was really tired at that point. And Andrea, my boyfriend, was working at Bloom Images. When we moved to Berlin, he did like, I don't know, 10, 20 interviews in architectural firms. And he did just one in an archivist's uh, office and that was Bloom Images. And I was actually a bit worried for him because I knew he was more into design than me and I told him you should pay attention because once you get into archivist maybe you don't are not able to get out anymore. But I was speaking and I really knew nothing about archivist. I was quite surprised it was a job at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was super happy about that and um, I realized that I wanted to give it a try too, but uh, my portfolio, <laughs> uh, let's not talk about that. But uh, I mean, I sent out a portfolio to every possible office uh, that was even touching Arquis at that point in Berlin, but it was like five maximum. It was nothing like, and we decided that I would not apply to Bloom Images. That was the deal. So I applied, I actually did two interviews and I got the offer for both of them. And I, I mean, I was really, really not good. I mean, I almost never <laughs> opened 3DS Max at that point. I did during university, but that was it. 
uh but yeah i mean i got this interview at eve images at that point the office was kind of mid-size now it's kind of huge mm -hmm. but at that point was mid-size and the interviews were held directly by the ceo that was uh justus Atemeyer that i think he now left the company but at that point he was the founder and the ceo and he was the person you would talk to and it was so inspiring and he saw something in me i still don't know what actually because if i look at that portfolio it gives me chills and goosebumps it's really <laughs> awful but i mean so something he said i mean you can it, it was amazing i think i had a one hour interview he said you can learn the job you can learn the software and everything but something i cannot really teach you it's to have a good eye and yeah. uh, to know how to express things through an image even if you don't know how to do it in 3d in a photorealistic way but just out of curiosity what kind of images did you have in your first portfolio i don't even know how to describe them. you have a background in landscape design so i can imagine yeah. they were mostly landscape related yeah i mean i think i placed there a couple of plans from competitions mm -hmm. so probably it was like 2d plans it was altogether and then filled in photoshop that's how we did it I should have a look at it. I mean, I, usually I try to avoid it, but uh, maybe I could have a look at it. <laughs> there was stuff from my from the university, actually. Mm. So I had some sections, some elevations, some kind of views that I had. I mean, it's been a while if I think about it now. But uh, yeah, it was like I had a couple of sections and elevation that were quite basic. It was just uh, AutoCAD stuff, but then I used some brush in brushes on Photoshop, like to make them water color painted. And he thought I water color painted them, but I told him, no, 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 no. I don't know even how to have in my hand uh, a pencil or anything, let alone a brush. At that point, there was no art visit at all, like zero. And that's something that actually stood out from, from the crowd somehow. It's like, oh, I received so many portfolios. They all look the same and yours was the difference. Yeah. I was like, yeah, mine is worse, <laughs> but he saw something and I'm still very grateful to him because he, he taught me the job. I started as an intern. I started at Sina as an intern and then I managed to get a proper contract. And then after a year, it was starting over again, but uh, it was worth it. I started from scratch. Uh, my mentor, Michi, he taught me everything about 3ds Max, like the, the software stuff. And at the beginning, I was working on pure 3D modeling. At that point, they were restructuring the, the library of the office. So I was either fixing the library or doing some custom model furniture or building some apartments for the other 3D artists. So it was not so exciting, maybe, but it was very helpful and I learned the stuff. And after six months, I went to him, knocked on the door and said, yeah, it's six months now. Can I do images now, please? The thing is that I was hired to probably join the exterior team because, I mean, I was working as a landscape architect and he would have loved me to do something like coordinating something about that. But I realized that I wasn't really into that and uh, I asked him to work in the interior team. And he said, let's try. And I think it worked pretty well. I really liked it. And yeah, I've been there in Berlin for two years, I think. Yeah, more or less two years. And then I moved back to Italy and I kept working for them uh, for some months. Okay, so the shift was that you already started working remotely from Italy for a German company. And yeah. that company was Eve Images already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I have the timeline more clear in my mind. <laughs> so, and that, that's when Render It came by. Yeah. We moved back to Italy, me and Andrea. We were quite lucky just to undertone it, I think. Because both of us went to our bosses and say, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I moved back to Italy. I mean, Berlin is nice, Berlin is cool, but I really want to move back. And we didn't know what to expect would have expected us. I mean, we were kind of thinking about starting freelancing or starting something like our company, if you can call it that, but still, 
it would have been freelancing. So we were preparing ourselves because we are like crazy about list and organizing. We had a name. We already started thinking about the library. We have not everything sorted, of course, but we were planning stuff. And, um, and then they told us, to both of us, uh, we would really like to keep you. Do you think there's a way? Then we thought, okay, freelancing could be a way. But when I get into some idea, I really, really get into it. Like, actually, at, at some point, I knew more about that stuff than my accountant. And we found that there was a way since we were within the European community and we could uh, actually be employed in a German company, but living and paying our taxes in Italy. It was a mess to find it out, find out how to do it in the bureaucratic stuff. But still, it was such an opportunity that we really had to sort it out. So yeah, it was me and Andrea bringing our jobs from Germany to Italy. And this was five years ago, four years ago. So it's been a while. I want to touch on this one later as well. As far as I understand now, you you keep working from home nowadays for your respective companies, which is blooming images, by the way, for both of you now. <laughs> yeah, now it's blooming <laughs> Okay, yes. And you work from home, but that's something that I want I want to touch on later because you were working from home before it became mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, I know my, my two cents about that. No, but I'm really interested in uh, knowing how you got started first with Render It and then with all the rest of the things you do. Right now you're an art director at Madi at uh, Madi UF. You also hold some courses at the uh, Brave Art Academy in Italy as well. So you have a, a lot of things on your plate. Let's start from the beginning, render it. So how did it get started? How did, I, did the idea come into your mind? I'm kind of passionate. So when something hits me, I, I really get into it, uh, as I said. And uh, it was a tough time for me. At Eve, we have some... It happened. Sometimes we had workloads that were up. Sometimes we had workloads that uh, were a bit down because the company grew so fast that to manage to the demand that they had at some point. But then, of course, it was not always like that. So there was a particular January in which I was not working fully because Mm. they didn't have enough jobs to do. And yeah, at some point, I wasn't really satisfied with with what I was doing anymore because um, the good thing for someone, it was uh, something that was a bit the bad thing for me at Eve, it was that it's super structured, that it's great mm. because it teaches you a lot. And uh, I mean, it's super good because you don't do a, a over hours and it works great. They are so good in, in organizing the stuff. They have the art director, the project managers. They even have the Photoshop artist. Like I, I was working just in 3D and at some point I thought, okay, I'm an architect with a master degree and I think I know something. I could bring something more to the table. But of course, working remotely, it was not possible at the time. I mean, uh, when I was leaving, they told me that if I was going to stay to Berlin, they want me to be kind, not the head of the interior department because we already had it, but help with that. But working remotely was not possible because, of course, you had to be there. So for me, it was not so easy to accept to have so many people above me. But that's just about my personality. Like, uh, I'm I'm a strong head, (laughs) really. So uh, as long as, as I'm learning, of course, I'm humble. But when, I mean, I'm always learning. I am not arrived anywhere, of course. But at at that point, I felt like I could bring more to the table and it was not possible due to the circumstances. And then I was not working that much. Yeah, I, I was not in the happiest place working related. And also since we moved back to Italy, I mean, I was working in a 30 something people office and Andrea was working in a 10, 20 something people office. And at some point it was just me and him in our house and I knew nobody in Italy that was doing this job, literally no one. The only person that I knew that was doing something related to this job was Fabio Dagnano, the director Mm -hmm. of the Madi. And so we started to get in contact with him and I contacted him through Rendering. So one step back, 
I was curious. So Reddit started just because I felt isolated. I was a bit down and I was curious to know how was the scene in Italy? Because at some point I was even thinking about starting freelancing anyway. It came out of curiosity, pure curiosity. And uh, I started interviewing some people that I thought might be interesting. I started searching around and then went down like an avalanche. Like um, I started know more people and get more contacts. And that's, I think, how the Madi thing happened. Mm -hmm. Because actually I interviewed Fabio and then uh, we were talking with him, me and Andrea, because he, he was uh, also a professor of ours during university. And we told him we were, uh, we knew that there were some super cool courses happening at Madi, if we could maybe attend some of them. And he said, mm. of course, you can join. And then we started joining always a bit more. I think the, uh, the year later, he asked us to come in just to have a look at the portfolios of the students, if we have some tips. I mean, we, we are like 40 kilometers from Venice, so for us, it's super easy to get there. And also maybe he thought that we could know something about what we do and uh, so that's how Randra it started and I mean for me it was amazing because that year I get in contact with some people like and I make I have to admit I, I really made also some real friends on the way I went to my first day to that, that year so it was super cool I mean uh, it started like one morning I woke up I think it was a Saturday I told Andrea I think I should do something like that. I think there's no Arquis community in Italy. There's mm. no one sharing stuff in Italy about it. I mean, 3D artists, yes, but more characters, more uh, gaming stuff, maybe. Mm. There was 3D, of course, but it, it's like a big chunk of everything uh, inside, with everything inside. But about Arquis, I knew nothing. So... Yeah, that's how it started. I started this podcast for the same very reason that you started your own <laughs> thing, because of isolation. Yeah. But it's funny because you felt this need way, way before everything happened, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so you also were ahead of the times with this as well. <laughs> <laughs> and you're also a full-time mom. I'm also a full-time mom. That's uh, my number one priority right now, mm -hmm. of course. My son is, I know, I, I, it feels like, talking about cheese when I say the months, but that's how it is. Till, till two years old, you have to say the months. Is 17 months? One and a half, something like that. Okay, right. He was born at the end of 2019. And then when he was four months old, the lockdown happened. <laughs> so it has been interesting, to say the least. As we discussed in our previous conversation, I just hope he doesn't really remember about all this time because memories start forming like since... Three or four years old. Uh, the thing is that when you're used to something, for him it's so natural, unfortunately. But I mean, uh, still he's going to the kindergarten uh, since he's nine months old. So he's socializing there with other kids. And for me, that was super important because otherwise it would have been crazy isolated. Mm. I mean, I don't go to playgrounds with him because we're not supposed to get in touch with other kids. I, I, I pass by and they are like, yeah. A nightmare but i think he, he kind of used to it because since he started seeing he started seeing masks and uh, the other day i was leaving to walk the, the dog and he knows a bit the routine now i have to pick up the shoes and he always he loves to pick up shoes so he went to the, for the shoes <laughs> and i was dressing the dog put the harness on her and uh, he brought me my mask and that kind of broke my heart a bit that he knew that to, in order to go out, you have to wear the, the mask, mm. but he's used to it, and sometimes he, he tried to, to push it down. Sometimes there are kids that scold parents and tell them, Mommy, why are not, aren't you wearing yeah, the right. mask? Yeah, yes. yeah, I mean, if there are rules, there are rules. Then. But I'm super lucky because I live outside of the city. Like, today we went to a park and there were nobody, and it was like a villa park, like super huge. So there we can skip the mask. So let's count. Sure. Your first priority is your kid. Sure. Then you have rendering. I would say prioritizing just to understand how I manage my day. So prioritizing for me, it's knowing that uh, since half past three, 
till seven o'clock something i am with my kids so that's okay. the, the first priority that was my question actually i was just making the count of what you have to deal with <laughs> so it's this of course uh this album that's render it that which is picking up right now i think you started doing also live streams recently yeah yeah since i have yeah time. you have the muddy as well so you yeah. you support students with their portfolios Mm -hmm. Am I forgetting something? Yeah, of course, your full-time job with Bloom Images. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's I would say that's my number two priority because that's my main job. So that's what I wake up and do. So my routine usually is uh, waking up, having breakfast with my kid and my husband. Then I walk a dog, so I get a bit of fresh air and fresh start. And then usually at 8, 8.30, I start working. And then I tend to do six hours straight. Uh, so that's the deal with, uh, with Bloom. After I had a kid, we talked and I said, I want to stay with my kid. I mean, I could hire a babysitter. I could ask my grandparents, but I mean, uh, his grandparents, my parents. Uh, but he's my priority. I mean, I made this kid because I want to stay with him. And I'm lucky enough to have a flexible job. So that was the deal that I would work six hours. And then I just had to let them know more or less when I was in the office. So um, I'm always reporting, but they know that usually I start at 8, 8.30. And then I go on till 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock, it depends. All right, yes. So you have to be really, really focused in those six hours. Yeah, but I think I'm actually, I think I'm doing more stuff now than when I was working eight hours. Because at some point you get tired. I mean, a Scandinavian knows that and they had this short shift or four weeks a day uh, for four days a week yeah. uh, mm -hmm. working days so i think working more it's not effective i mean working less and being more focused it is but staying there just because you have to stay there makes no sense to me is there any particular technique because there's a lot of techniques online you know this pomodoro thing and time mm. blocking do you have any particular technique that you use for scheduling your your own time or it just comes natural to you andrea my husband he used something like toggle okay, and yeah. he keeps track of the time i use clockify but just to keep track on the time that i work at madi because mm. most of the time i'm working on weekends and nights i mean not nights evenings uh so when we have a meeting or something i just tend to to write it down just to to have an idea of how much i'm working uh but no i mean when I have a tight uh, project or a tight deadline, I just work with list, but like paper stuff. So I can underline it and sign it out when it's done. Um, but uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't have a specific technique, I would say. And uh, I try to organize my stuff because I also take care of the social media of Bloom Images right now. So that's something that I do like when I start the morning, like every two or three days. And after that, I get into the email and I check what's going to happen that day. Right. But then you surely have learned something in terms of time management, not just techniques, but having so many things going on. Probably thought you how to manage your own time. Yeah. Or is it also a matter of discipline, perhaps? I mean, I've never been a disciplined person. I have to admit, I'm pretty messy. And I never kept the same sport, for example, for more than a year or two. Mm. So I would love to say that I'm disciplined, but I'm not in that way. But working-wise, um, I've been a really bad student in high school, like the worst. Uh, but then when... I started university, I kind of, I don't know, matured all the way <laughs> and I started to, to be super organized. So when I, it's about work, I'm very, very organized, but also mm -hmm. when it's about house and family, actually, I, I run stuff, uh, something that I really, really use. It's simply a calendar. A Google Calendar, and I write down everything I have to do. And if I know that I have a deadline or something that I should definitely do, I always put it down. So right. I see it visually. So it that really helps me. So okay. calendars, that's something that I do a lot. Okay, so lists and calendars. Yeah. I think it's pretty simple, but 
it should be intuitive, but it's not actually so widespread. Lists is something that not all people use, yeah. especially when working on images. I do lists all the time, for example. I do Excels. I mean... Excels, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when I work on images, I have paper lists like you, yeah. not Excel. I don't, I don't get no, to write Excel. No, paper lists. Okay. But, um... but for small tasks, for example, okay, put, put yeah. in 3D people or uh, change a material, exactly. all this kind of stuff, no? And then I have a master file. I have a. I don't know if you if you know about Notion, this web app. No, it's um. No. It's very interesting because it allows you to build kind of a database system. Okay. It's very complicated, but once you get into that, it's very rewarding because then you can connect information from all aspects of your life, and they connect okay. with each other. So That's I'm good. really slowly trying to get into Notion right now. Just my personal project. Uh, okay. All the social media, all the mm -hmm. content creation images, yeah. uh, future courses are all there. But I want to start putting in also things that I learn. Like when I see an interesting YouTube video, I want to put it into a database and try to get it out when I need it for a particular mm -hmm. project. It's a long process. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I don't want good. to be sidetracked here. <laughs> um, there's something that I want to ask, which is something that I'm struggling with lately kind of a personal crisis, I will say, mm -hmm. which relies a lot on personal research and artistic research. Mm -hmm. When you are strapped for time, in my case, I'm a freelance, I'm a solopreneur or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I have to, you know, deal with all, all by myself, images, yeah. communication clients and accounting, uh, etc. If you want to run your own business, there's very little time left for artistic research. And even yes. if you run multiple projects, Mm -hmm. artistic research is a bit sacrificed by the you know the sheer amount mm -hmm. of time you get from other projects so mm -hmm. how much do you value artistic research in this particular moment a lot uh, mm. because that's what keeps me thriving i would say i mean that's something i've never done before uh, last year I went to conferences, I was like, oh my, I'm sorry, my kid is crying. I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. I want to test it out. And I never did all the time like that. I was super hyped and I did nothing at all. And then when I was on maternity leave, when I went to maternity leave, actually, I was thinking about leaving ArtWiz for good because I was working a bit too much and being pregnant and working too much, it's not good. Hormones were crazy, and, but even if it was not hormones, still, it, 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 I, I went through a, a, a bad time at that point. And then I had my kid and I say, okay, maybe I do something else. I don't know, dog training. I was really ready to leave it. And when I started my maternity leave, Andrea told me, oh, maybe you could do some personal project. I think I barked at him. I said, what are you thinking? <laughs> My free time at the computer? Are you crazy? But I mean, at that point, um, my belly was so big that I wasn't even able to reach the keyboard. So that made sense. But then my kid was here and I wasn't sleeping at all. So that was definitely not uh, my thought. But then when the lockdown happened and luckily it started napping a bit and I was, I mean, in Italy, I don't think it happened anywhere else that we were really not allowed to go out of our house. I don't know. In other places, they talk about lockdown. Just later in some yeah. places. Later than Italy, for sure. Yeah, but I think in other places it was lockdown in the sense that everything closed, but not they, they couldn't even go to the park. Hmm. And in Italy, we weren't, I mean, we had a, 200 meters radius from our house allowance <laughs> that was the maximum so at that point i wasn't even going out with the kids i mean we were scared and everything so i say i mean it's small i shouldn't leave the apartment so i think i am i, I haven't left the apartment for, for a month with him mm. i was walking a dog every now and then but and at that point i had some free time if you can call it like that because i went on maternity leave and the baby was napping a bit and um i was like what what could i do and i had this project i started the year before because the year before i was attending a postgraduate master while working in interior design and communication at the university and then i got pregnant and then it was pretty tough because I had to discuss my thesis with my three weeks old son next to me. But um, I started the personal project at some point and say, ah, it would be cool to try to reproduce some photos from Vals, the thermo, 
of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Peter Zumthor. Yeah. But I, I just started a scene and left it there. Okay. Yeah. Forgot about it. And during the lockdown, uh, something clicked in me, and I started. And since then, I, I never, I, I never stopped. Actually, I think I did, I don't know, thirty, forty images in, in during the last year, like mm. from last March to now. Mm. And actually, uh, I found out working more on exteriors when I'm working on my personal project. But something. Um, it's really uncomfortable for me because I'm in Bloom Images. I'm kind of the interior specialist. Yeah. And that's what I like to do, actually. I mean, I don't like when I have a landscape project. Right, yes, yes. <laughs> or a big uh, urban thing. That's not what I like. I like doing interiors and products. But mm. when I do in my free time, I like to experiment. So um, it's both the, the soft skills, like the training the eye and this kind of things, so I tried at some point to reproduce some photographs, mm -hmm. but not just to reproduce them. To, for me, it was the most interesting thing was to, to learn how to use the light. So mm. I did a series of images in black and white, mm. uh, following the photographs of Tommaso Sartori, that's an Italian very good photographer. And also learning some some actually softer skills, like mm -hmm. I played with volumetrics, um, playing with caustics and this kind of stuff that I just heard about. It's nothing crazy, but I never touched them before. So now it's something, I mean, if I, if it goes a month by that I don't do something, I kind of get itchy, like, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but I, I don't think it will go on forever. At some point, I guess I'll stop. But for now, it's like that. So for me... It's very important uh, because sometimes when you're working on your clients, mm. you lose the passion and when you're working a mm. bit too much, even more. And then you don't understand why you do that anymore, maybe. And uh, I do it because I really like it. And working on personal projects kind of reminds me of that. And that's something um, I was talking with Adredi the other day that I, I, I heard from a speech, from a talk, mm -hmm. that actually if you have to more than one job, I mean, that's something you should think about doing because maybe not they're not all paid. Maybe one is a pro job and one is a personal, more kind of a personal project. But then it's not that you have just one thing because if thing goes south with that, that thing or you got super stressed, you have just that and you keep yeah. focusing on that. If you have something else, maybe an hour in the evening, I mean, of course you can have also a life. Of yeah, course sure. you can go outside hiking. That's that's something you I should really recommend too because that's something that makes me feel very good. But still, I don't know, I like having something else that gives me a purpose and that goes well maybe while something else is not going that amazing. Yeah, maybe it's not for everyone, but... I think it's something that artists, in particular 3D artists, should really consider. The profession is, is tough and it can have an impact on oneself, on mental health mm -hmm. and physical health yeah. sometimes. So I think it's good that we deliver this message to everybody that's listening to us that there's something else beyond Arcvis. Yeah, personal projects, cool, okay. But I think there should be something else beyond that. As, as you said, it's very important. If things go sideways... You have to have other skills ready. For example, mm -hmm. through Render It, you learned a lot about social media, about yeah. podcasting as well, about conversation, about interviewing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's skills that you can use outside in a potential new job, for yeah. example. So personally, it's something that I would recommend to 3D artists. Try new things that are not just images. Although, of course, I understand that personal research is still very important in our field. Mm -hmm. But as an individual, as a whole individual, I think that personal research on other fields is still very, very important. Mm -hmm. And how had this helped you in tangible ways? How, for example, render it? Well, you mentioned already render it, but doing, for example, the portfolio reviews and art direction for Madi, mm -hmm. uh, how did it help you as a person in your day-to-day -day life, in your, you know, attitude? For sure, working on all these things, meeting all these people and getting to know all these people, it helped my confidence a lot, a lot mm -hmm. because as I said I mean I started from less than zero when I started in Berlin 
I think I went through some sort of depression at, when I moved there. Uh, as I said, I mean, I say it in a funny way, but really being the only one in the office not speaking the language and being left out every lunch, and there was nothing there. Like, you remember that place because you work in the surrounding too. There were no, no bars, no nothing. So it was there. I had to be there all day long. Sometimes it was the night too. Um, and it was my first time in a foreign country. So uh, that was really something that hit me pretty hard. And it mm. took me a, quite a while to, to recover from that. And when I moved back to Italy, I, I it kind of went down again a bit, being away from the office of Eve, things were not working that great for me at the time. So it really helped me build confidence. Like, uh, I don't mean it in a cocky way, but I'm confident now because uh, I don't like to brag about, it's not about bragging, but I know I can do what I do. And I know that someone, if someone calls me to do something, probably they saw something in me. So at some point, when someone was offering me a job, I was like, why? Why should they want me? Now I, I'm, I say, yes, I'm happy to do that. I'm glad to do that. But of course, it's about building. This year, I started teaching too. Last year, I started teaching too. That's something I never did before. Of course, at the beginning, it, like um, the Brave Art Academy, it's an online course, so it's pre-registered. So... I was a little bit less anxious about that, but still super anxious to deliver good content. And then I, we have every week two hours of reviews. And at that point I was like freaking out. Like, what if I don't know what they ask me about and all this stuff. And that was the first time I, I taught. Then the time after was at Madi, like in person. And I wasn't sleeping the night before. I mean, I wasn't realizing it, but I was super, super nervous. But then it gets better and you learn something new. And and that's something you can bring to your everyday work. Like uh, we do some workshop within Bloom Images um, between ourselves, between the company. And uh, that's something I would probably wouldn't felt confident to do because I say what if I say something wrong what but now I just like to share the thing is that I really like to share and uh, for example with render it and the social media stuff and everything I asked the Bloom Images team if it would be interesting for them if I could take care of mm -hmm. that because the, the guy that took care of it before left and it's adding stuff. Um, I remember when I was at Sinai at some point, I found out that there is there was a job. Uh, the person was working as PR. I didn't even know what a PR mm -hmm. was. And I thought, I, I think I would like to do something like that. But how do you do that? How you, do you get a job? I'm not really working as a PR right now, but... It's close. I'm kind of getting it's close, yeah. something like that. So I'm working my ways to doing something that I really like. Yeah. And then thanks to these projects, you're a living example of how to discover new skills. So I highly recommend it to all artists, not to just tunnel vision on images also because images can get stressful at times. Yeah. <laughs> I that from, from experience as well. Yeah. Uh, I want to touch on what we mentioned briefly before that mm -hmm. you have basically been working from home for three years now, almost or more than three years. Almost four. Yeah. Almost four. So you have a lot of experience on this mm -hmm. aspect, things that many of us had to learn from scratch during this lockdown. Um, <laughs> I, I think work from home is here to stay. I'm hearing... A yeah. lot of companies, even in our field, that are shifting to remote work to a certain extent. There's a lot of international scenarios companies and they're pushing for going back to their home countries while keeping working for their own original companies. Yeah. So that's a sign of the times. Remote work is here to stay. Big tech are shifting 100% remotely. So what I want to ask you is, what did you learn in four years of working from home? First of all, I really like it. I think it's not for everyone, but uh, I really like it. I mean, I really love it. That's something I miss sometimes. It's of course the 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 coffee chit chat and these kind of things. And but I mean, I'm lucky because we are two. Uh, it's me and Andrea, so we still give us each other feedbacks. Uh, we're still two. I'm not alone. So that's something. So if you're alone, maybe you should consider doing a couple of days in a shared 
space or I don't know try to have a call with someone at least once a week to review your work his work her work so you can confront with someone else I mean that's something we started to do at Bloom too uh, also because all of our seniors are working from home right now uh, the juniors are in the office and we started doing these images reviews and th those are not just about the the work we do in the office those are also about the work we do in our free time and that's super helpful because we see what everyone is working on because usually when you are in an office you just walk by and have a look at the screen and you see that so that's something uh, company based i would say so even if you're not working in a company you work freelance find someone that you trust share stuff with them it's not they're going to steal something from you uh, you're just going to learn something new probably and uh, having a proper space that's absolutely mandatory like not working from your living room it's not possible for everyone i know that but find a way to place a door or i don't know a curtain something but find a way to close the door to unplug the telephone when you're done i mean for me it's easy actually i just i just do that i mean i know when i'm done i'm done sometimes it's not after i work six hours of course but when i'm done with the things that i had to do of course sometimes i think about it I, still but most of the time i'm really able to to switch off and uh that's i think more personality based because for example for andrea it's way harder for us it's it's really different that's why when we were just the two of us with no, no baby i was all the time trying to keep a tight daily schedule yeah and some routine so yeah. at, at some hour we had to have lunch every day it was maybe sometimes it was one o'clock maybe half past one but never after two o'clock of course it happened but trying to have a schedule and having a dog really helped us because we had to go out of our place and that's also a good excuse during lockdown because it was the only way to get out <laughs> at some point it was the, the lucky fuse where the dog i remember march 2020 <laughs> <laughs> yes i was making yeah. photos making everyone jealous but for real make a dog a cat something that make you company i mean pet therapy it's not something that i invented it's it's true i mean it really helps me having her around and then really like on weekends or after you're done unplug the freaking telephone because the, nobody's going to die that's something i always tell andrea i mean sometimes I, I, i'm a bit sad that our job is not not that important for the world because it's really i mean sometimes client calls you like are dying but really makes no difference if you print it tomorrow and that's something i try to remind to andre all the time like we're not that useful to society nobody's going to die if you apply. i mean did they answer within the time they were given no then i have a look tomorrow it's not like that you answer them at 11 in the evening it's going to make things better it's going to make things worse because they think they can do that and they shouldn't it's not easy with architects because we are architects too and we know <laughs> what it is to work on competition and this kind of deadlines sometimes they tell me that i'm a bit too strict the, the germans tell me that i'm a bit too strict and i'm a bit too german but really with my clients i'm like that like i'm really clear about when i'm in the office when i'm not in the office what i'm going to do what i'm not going to do uh, if they don't give me some information at some point i think there's a lot of useful uh, info lisa I, honestly i'm guilty of not doing all these things i mean <laughs> i'm the kind of guy that goes the extra mile works on weekends skips lunch and for me it's really really difficult you know it depends i mean if it's worth it but it's most of the time it's not i mean i'm also skipping lunch and working and going to extra miles if it's worth it for some most of the time it's for something else i can understand that i can justify that to a certain extent because it's your own project is your own passion yeah, is the exactly. thing that you you're really passionate about and you want to make it work for yourself of course with your own office it's for you it's the same yeah yeah but but still, there's a lot of sense in what you said because you have to put boundaries, both special boundaries and boundaries with your clients. For example, the separation of spaces is very important because one has to be the space of work, like one room or one area of the house, and 
the rest should be space for leisure and for relax. So yeah, th that's for sure going to help. The most difficult thing I think is being assertive with your own clients and let them understand that after a certain hour, you are not responsive anymore because you have your own stuff. I had a bad boss in the Netherlands, which used to call during weekends, and I had a bad imprinting on that. So, <laughs> really bad yeah, imprinting. Yeah, they could try. I mean, I told you, I was working 70 hours a week when I was working as an architect. So I did that. I didn't like that, but I did that. And I can still do it if it's worth it, but most of the time it's really not. Hmm. So just try to understand when it's, make sense to do it so most of the time you will see that they will come the day later and say oh, actually we have another change and if you didn't do the other one I mean, most of the time you just lose your time that's like work for nothing but some last piece of advice uh, going back to the picking up different activities for for artists do you have any advice to people that want to discover something else about themselves their passions and something else that they could explore in their own time, apart from doing images? Yeah, I mean, ah, let me think about that. <laughs> I think... Um... I can start. For example, I'm a, I'm a huge Dungeons & Dragons fan. I started role-playing in 2019, so very recently. And I was thinking of using my <laughs> my 3D skills for drawing 3D maps. Yeah, environments. Mm -hmm. Doing maps for players, you know. Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to use your skills to do something different and to think outside the box. The gaming field is thriving. So. I mean, my girlfriend's a video game translator and she hasn't stopped working since the pandemic. She has doubled her own workload. So I can tell you for sure that. Yeah, I I'm also getting a bit into that world because some of our students are curious about that. And uh, yeah. I just met a person that is super good in that field. But um, getting back to your question, no, I mean, I know what I like to do in my off time, but I was thinking about some tips. But for me, it's trying to, to see what excites me, what really makes me uh, interested and happy. Most of the time it's traveling, hiking and making photographs. If I could make a job out of it, that would be nice. Mm. Uh, I never tried that much in that direction. Maybe I could push a bit more, but... <laughs> I don't think I will ever be a travel photographer, even if me and Andrea, we thought about that a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's something, but uh, actually that's something I translate to what I do. I mean, um, I was so depressed that I couldn't travel that I started making images out of photos that I took in Iceland, for example. So I try kind of translated that there and try to see what makes you curious. Like, for example, for me it was, uh, as I told you, it was back in time that I found out that there was this kind of PR people. And I told Andrea, that's something I would do, like to do, but how? And I mean, I'm, it's not really that I'm doing it, but uh, and it's, it's not really that I'm getting paid for that, that's for sure. But still, I'm kind of doing it and I really like it. So study yourself. Try to see what after a full day of something, where you're excited, where you're curious, where you're interested. But most of the time, it's not about archivists. But um, if there were still conference, uh, another suggestion would be to attend them. But <laughs> what can I say? I will also go ahead and say try to listen to yourself. I was yeah. I was attending uh, in 2018 a, a meetup with Paolo Zambrini and Christian mm -hmm. Chierici. Yeah. Paolo Zambrini is the CEO from Engram Studio. Christian Chierici works at Luxigo Milan, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are talking about Arvis artists and Italian ones. Italian Arvis artists, yeah. Uh, and they were talking about personal images and personal projects, and they had a completely different approach to the thing. Christian, oh. every single moment he had, he, he used to do personal images, personal mm -hmm. projects, while Paolo was using his own free time to do something else that he was not doing images. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to feed my mind with something else that is not doing images. Yeah, sure. So, guys, listen to yourself, listen to your mind and your body mm -hmm. and try to understand what recharges you yeah. outside doing images. And it's not always the same. It depends on the time you're living, on the experiences you're having. I mean, two years ago, I would never open the computer in my free time to do a personal project. Now I'm just a different person with different needs. I mean, and a bit 
less time to see to hang out with friends due to to lockdown but yeah i think that's also something that hit us pretty hard and changed our habits a lot lisa i think that's been a great conversation and that uh, thank you that's it i think for today you know thank you really you've been generous with your time i don't know if you have anything left to say who's listening to us any announcement or future project i think for now i'm just keep going with all the things that I am doing and the only thing is really try to make a community around yourself uh, also in in this field because you will be surprised how people are open to share knowledge uh, about everything it's not just about tutorials and asking how do you do that or Mm -hmm. can I have that map it's about how they manage stuff and this kind of thing and uh, I think sharing is caring. That's what Render It is about. And that's why I also started the community. That's why I'm doing the live now instead of the interviews because I really like let people share stuff, let the possibility to other people to ask directly. So yeah, share if you have something to share and ask if you have some curiosity. Lisa, thank you so much. Hope to see you soon in person pretty soon. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you, Federico, for having me. It's been a pleasure. I really hope that uh, maybe something could be helpful to someone. I'm pretty sure it's going to be. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Ciao, Federico. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed, please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting app and get a new episode every second week. If you like this episode, help us growing and improving the show by rating and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts got a question or is there something you would like me to cover in a future episode write me an email at podcast at bigpicturevisual.com thank you again for listening and see you next time